Okay, please take your seats if you don't already have one. And we're going to begin. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the Atlanta Council. I'm Steve Grundman. I am a senior fellow here in the Scowcroft Center, the Scowcroft Center on Strategy and Security, part of the Atlanta Council. Um, thanks very much, all of you, for coming, uh, both here in the room and those of you who may well be uh, watching the live stream of, of the event on, online. Thanks very much. Uh, the purpose of this event is to launch a report by Bill Greenwald entitled Leveraging the National Technology Industrial Base to Address Great Power Competition. Uh, copies of this Fresh from the Presses document are available uh, out there, so if you didn't take one, two, if you'd like, um, you ought to do that. <clears throat> you, you, ought to, you ought to take it with you. Um, presently, I, I'm going to introduce Bill, and he'll spend about 20 minutes or so at the beginning of the event here uh, to give us an overview of its key findings and recommendations. Uh, following that, uh, I will invite three panelists uh, who sit before me here uh, to join Bill, and, and they will engage in a discussion. Uh, somewhere around 10 past or quarter past uh, five, I will reemerge to moderate questions from those of you here in the audience. Those of you online uh, could uh, submit questions to us over Twitter. Uh, we are tweeting, live tweeting, I guess I should call it, this event at the hashtag AC Defense. Uh, so hashtag AC Defense. And if you put a good question in, uh, one of the staff will bring it to me. And if it's really good, I will uh, interject it into the Q&A during those last 20 minutes of the event. This event comes against the backdrop of an unusual uh, spate of attention that's being given to the defense industrial base. Uh, a little more than a year ago, uh, the publication of the National Defense Strategy called out uh, what it called, proper noun here, national security uh, industrial base. Uh, for its strategic significance. Um, the Executive Order 13806 uh, was published in the summer of 2017 and resulted in a, uh, an assessment of the defense industrial base's vulnerabilities and shortcomings, which was published in the fall of last year, you may recall. Um, over the two years of this administration, there has been a campaign of tariffs to protect American manufacturing, some of which uh, have been expressly justified on a national security basis. And then, of course, in, in o o overriding or, or sort of across all of these events has been an enduring friction uh, with our NATO and other allies over burden sharing and to some degree even over acquisition choices. All these things set the stage for this report, uh, which in its subtitle uh, we are calling, help me uh, hold that up please, the imperative to integrate industrial capabilities of close allies after all. So before we move to the substance of the event, I'm going to uh, render a few administrative notes, uh, the first of which is that this event is on the record. Uh, I've said we are live streaming it over our website. So during the Q&A, if I call upon you to answer a question, please uh, identify yourself and your affiliation before asking it. Um, I mentioned that we're tweeting this event at uh, hashtag AC Defense. Um, if I recognize you for a question, please ask one question. Uh, I'll hold you to that. And then also, uh, we'll need to end the event at 5.30. So if the clock is running toward 5.30 when there are still two or three hands in the air uh, and we'd like to give everyone an opportunity to get their question in, uh, please help me to paste the questions and the answers um, to meet a 5.30 uh, departure uh, deadline. This event, today's event, is the 16th in the Atlanta Council's Defense Industrial Policy Series. Uh, this series is an initiative to make, preeminent, to make a preeminent platform available to public officials and others, uh, in today's uh, case, others, uh, who can address government's stewardship of defense industrial resources. Previous speakers in this series include the acquisi acquisition executives of the U.S. Military Departments and U.S. Special Operations Command, Secretary of the Air Force, former Secretary of the Air Force, uh, Deborah James, Secretary of the Army, Mark Esper, who was here last year, and most recently, uh, the current Undersecretary for Acquisition and Sustainment, Ellen Lord, who was on this stage just a month ago talking about 5G networks and technologies and the acquisition challenge they present. All of that having been said, let me now welcome, ah, no, there is an important ad addition before I welcome Bill uh, Greenwald to the stage, and that is to thank uh, the financial sponsors and steering board members of this study. So this report uh, arises from a study of the National Technology Industrial Base we undertook uh, with some guidance from a steering board comprising uh, three gentlemen uh, who are seated over here in the first row. Peter Lengel from Safran USA, the Chief Executive Officer of Safran USA. 
John Pranzatelli, uh, the Chief Executive Officer of MBDA Inc. Um, and Einar Gustafsson, who uh, has a number of hats, but um, might be best known as the Counselor for Defense Industrial Cooperation <coughs> at, the, at the Embassy of Norway. Um, now, let me welcome, actually, no, thank you. <laughs> Truly, uh, thank you. Uh, I should also mention uh, Einar represents a, uh, what I've been calling a syndicate of Norwegian com companies under the rubric of the Norwegian American uh, Defense and Homeland Security Industry Council, uh, among who, uh, who are represented here, NAMO, <coughs> as well as Kongsberg. And I really, I, I thank them all, right? We cannot do this work without the financial support of uh, sponsors like them. Uh, and I, I, I should not trip past too quickly that thank you. It's, 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 uh, it's genuine, and, and I appreciate it very much, all of you. Um, now, let me welcome Bill Greenwalt uh, to the stage, and, and we can get started with the substance of the event. Bill is a non-resident senior fellow here at the Scowcroft Center. Uh, he, uh, more generally, is an advisor and a consultant to a range of government and private sector clients on defense and government matters. He is also the co-founder of Brinkley Greenwalt Capital Partners, which invests in next generation firms selected for their high potential in the defense and commercial markets. So Bill is living and breathing uh, these matters on, on both sides of the government policy and corporate and uh, capital markets um, sides of, of the question every day. Previously, Bill uh, worked in the United States Senate where he was a professional staff member on the Senate Armed Services Committee. Uh, he also was a visiting fellow at the Maryland Ware Center for Security Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. He served in senior positions at the Pentagon, including as Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Industrial Policy during the uh, Bush 43 administration, though it might be said, uh, Bill will be one of only three uh, people who have served in that job who will be on the stage today. Um, finally, uh, in industry, Bill also has that in his uh, resume. He was Director for Federal Acquisition Policy at Lockheed Martin. Bill has written a great report, um, uh, let me tell you. Uh, among the things that, which if you haven't thumbed through it already, you will find is he, he not only makes recommendations, um, he has spelled out the very legislative language that would embody and express into law um, what it is that, that, that we are recommending and even a range of alternatives uh, for, for solving that. Um, so he has really taken this job seriously. He has uh, done a substantial body of research. I don't know if he's going to talk about the, the various travels that he's made to do this. Um, the, this, is, this is no kind of polemic. This is a, this is a thoughtful, well-researched uh, uh, report uh, with uh, deliberately practical uh, recommendations. And, and uh, again, as I say, he has spelled the recommendations all the way out to uh, the, the very commas and prepositions of legislative language that would make this work, make this real. Um, so it's with great pleasure and, and pride on behalf of the Atlantic Council that I welcome Bill to the stage to give us this overview that we can then use as the foundation for a discussion among uh, also distinguished panel whom I will introduce when they come to the stage. But for now, Bill Greenwald. Perfect. Well, uh, thank you, Steve, and thanks to the uh, uh, steering board, and thanks to all of you who uh, have come here to, uh, uh, to, to listen to this. Uh, this was a, 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 a terrific study uh, in the sense that uh, I, I enjoyed doing it. Uh, I enjoyed traveling to our partner uh, nations. I enjoyed talking to industry, to governments, um, and, uh, and individuals on the Hill, individuals in, in, in the administration. Uh, it's, it's, I, I was able to, to glean a lot, and, and frankly, I went beyond just our NTIB partners. I get, got a lot of great information from, uh, from various other um, uh, 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 sources. How do, I do the, how do I do the clicker? Well, where is the clicker? Oh, there we go. It's, it's hiding. Thank you. So um, um, thank you for the introduction. Let me, let's get on with, on with this real quick. Uh, there we go. OK. First thing, if, if you don't know what the NTIB is, the NTIB is a statutory uh, uh, concept that the Congress created back in uh, 1992. 
uh, on the 1993 National Defense Authorization Act, and it included the uh, U.S. and Canadian industrial base. And it was, it's the concept that the Congress has used to essentially um, uh, define industrial base planning for the, uh, the U.S. And it, and, uh, and, and it came about after the Cold War. It came about as a way of, of, uh, of trying to maintain a robust defense industrial base that was frankly under threat because defense spending was, was, was declining. In uh, 2017, in a different environment, uh, or 2016 in the 2017 NDA, the Australians and the, and the uh, United Kingdom uh, were added to that for, for a number of reasons. And, and here in the congressional direction, the idea is let's create a, a seamless integration between the four partner nations within our industrial base. And, and so obviously, that's the, 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 the where we want to see if we can actually get there. So why the study? Well, we don't have a seamless integration of, uh, of an NTIB yet. And so the idea was let's take a look at this and, uh, and determine whether uh, uh, what's the path forward. And so hopefully there's a number of uh, potential uh, 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 ideas that could offer a path forward into creating a industrial base that is a seamless integration between the four industrial base, uh, bases of the, uh, the four nations. So as I went through the objectives, and, and I, I tried to ask a number of questions as I was going along doing the study. And uh, in, in a nod to Steve, who recently just did a great uh, article in Aviation Week, if you haven't seen it, on uh, Andy Marshall. I want to say, first of all, I'm no Andy Marshall. But I like to, to essentially uh, try to ask questions that, that, that uh, will, will elicit greater debate. And so in, in, in this entire study, I kept asking these questions on, on, on where we should go. So um, obviously, you know, why did I do, do, or why did we try to do this study? To find a path forward, but also to, this was something that when I was working for Senator McCain, we had uh, had some future ideas on, on where to go, but it, because of jurisdictional issues and because of a lot of just, this, this issue was much harder. So we set the stage, but there's a lot more, more uh, ways to go. Um, a lot of these were, were, were questions that I, I went through. I'll just kind of answer them really relatively quickly. Were the defense trade treaties between the US and Australia and the UK a failure? Yes, okay? And, and that's another reason why we needed to kind of go forward. This, this was not a positive uh, uh, outcome. Uh, what's the relationship between acquisition reform and technology transfer reform? As I will come uh, later in the, in the presentation, integrally integrated. The idea is how do we gain innovation within the US industrial base? And that means going out beyond what we're, our comfort level. Where will future innovation come from? Everywhere. It's going to come from our traditional industrial base. It's going to come from non-traditional industrial base. It's going to come from commercial companies who are globalized. And the idea is how do we access this industrial base? What are the barriers to seamless integrated and tip? As we go through here, it's our acquisition system. It's our export control system. It's the culture. And so hopefully I can walk through and, 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 and get a better understanding why. And, and, and as you go through the study, I think you'll see where I'm, where I'm coming from. And obviously, why the focus on legislative language? Well, unfortunately, I'm, a, I'm a, a hill rat for about 25 years. That's how I think. But at the same time, it, it's, it's, it's one of the most successful things that I had when I was on the hill was when someone would give me legislative language. And the Section 800 report, way back in 1990, was probably the best report that I've ever seen because it laid out the steps to do that. And that's what I tried to do in this particular study. All right, I'm not going to go too much over this, but I just want to say you've got to set the stage and understand where we were and where we are and where we innovated. Because if you don't understand where we innovated, the issue of whether we need to bring in a, a larger industrial base is probably moot. So as we go through how we innovated, what you'll see, and this was the basis for even acquisition reform, was we started off with World War II, working with our allies, working with a commercial industrial base. Everyone was geared up. Civil mill integration was everywhere. And our Canadian partners, 
We were the arsenal of democracy, and our Canadian partners were essentially the arsenal of the empire. And we geared up, and we did some amazing things. Then when the Cold War started, there were no processes and rules. Essentially, the 50s and 60s, early 60s were about getting capability to the warfighter as fast as possible. The second offset, by the time we got there, in the mid-1970s, were about how can we get capability of the warfighter war going around a system that we had created that precluded innovation. And uh, uh, so we end up with PGM, Stealth, GPS. And then for probably 30 years, we went on a incremental 15 to 20 year cycle of innovation. And we have to kind of think why, why that's the degree. Why, why do we do that? All right. What's the compelling case for bringing in a new industrial base? It's the same as acquisition reform. And the acquisition reform imperative was we need innovation. Why? Because the threat's increasing. The threat's not only increasing, but we're falling behind. We're losing our technological dominance. Maybe we're on the cusp of it. Maybe we're still ahead. Maybe we're a little bit behind. But we're losing that dominance. And the third area is that the management processes, like export controls, like the 5000 series, like the contracting process, are geared and optimized for the Cold War and for a different place and a different time. So the threat, as we all know, is not the Cold War. It's probably worse. We have uh, the China and Russia are not the Soviet Union. They're not thinking in five-year plans. They're not thinking in, uh, in ways which we can uh, create a, a, uh, a Soviet-style management system to counter them. And, and we have a pretty idea of what action reaction is going to be. Uh, it's a different world. And we'll talk about why, why that is. We have to deal with medium-sized powers. We have to continue to deal with, with terrorism. But I think the biggest threat we have to think about, and we didn't have to think about that with the Soviet Union, is because we are at parity. We are at parity as population, um, and we had a greater, greater economy. We have to think of China, what I think is as a 4x four, a four problem. They're four times our population. That means probably somewhere within there, they're eventually going to have four times or more engineers and scientists. Eventually, they might have a greater economy than us to pull off uh, resources. How are we going to compete against that? Uh, well, the idea is our GDP is bigger right now. We can have more R&D productivity. I guess we can let more immigration in and cr increase our population, but that probably is a little political uh, issue going on. So we're going to need our allies. We're going to need to partner with other countries to build up the ability to have the, the base in which to compete with a country that is four times our size. So how do we, how do we lose our technological dominance? Well, since the Cold War, we've kind of kind of been moving a little slowly. We've been doing incremental in, in, uh, investment, upgrading of technologies that we created in the second offset. And so our adversaries have had 30 years to catch up to replicate what we have, to steal what we had, to take advantage, asymmetric advantage, uh, because they don't have to deal with the, the, um, um, the already uh, uh, bought, pa bought and paid for base that we already have. But most importantly, it's the research and development trends. Beginning in the Cold War, back in the 60s and 70s, US government drove innovation drove research and development spending. About 1980, US commercial research and development achieved parity with the government. And since that time, commercial research and development has moved on and on and on and on. Why is that important? Because innovation is coming out of that research and development. Where research and development dollars go and what they're spending is where innovation is coming out of. 
And the U.S. government is becoming smaller and smaller, and DOD, is, as a percentage of U.S. government, is becoming smaller and smaller as far as R&D. Now, DOD is only going to be spending money in the hypersonics. That's great. But there are other areas we need to take advantage of. And our adversaries are doing that. So we've got the adversaries approaching asymmetric approaches, the commercial marketplace moving forward, and our allies haven't stopped, been sitting still either. They've been investing slowly but surely over the last 30 years, and there's some really great technology and really great niche, tech, niche technologies uh, over there. All right. The last problem we have is our Cold War management processes. Optimize, replace, and time an adversary no longer exists. Just to kind of walk through that. Acquisition system, established in 1971, the 5000 series. Contracting, 1962, TINA, Truth and Negotiations Act. Cost accounting standards, 1970. Our budget system is a relic of uh, Secretary McNamara bringing in the best and brightest Ford Motor Companies budget process, which was pretty much looked like the Soviet five-year plan that we've continued with today. Information management was all done, Computer Security Act, 1987. Personnel, which Samantha knows very well, 78, Civil Service Act. But most importantly to this, this particular uh, discussion, the Arms Export Control Act of 1976. These are all Cold War ideas adapted around a time and place when the U.S. was technologically dominant. We're no longer. Innovation's coming out of from different places. But these processes are legacy processes that we have to continue to address. And it's going to be very difficult for us to innovate unless we change those processes. We tried to do something in acquisition reform in 2015 and 17. But the rest of these processes remain unchanged. And that is going to be a huge problem when we try to actually implement acquisition reform. So, as far as dealing with how we're going to integrate and seamlessly integrate with our allies, export controls came up as the uh, major barrier. Obviously, there are others. But uh, this is the one area where it made perfect sense in 1975 to establish the uh, uh, process that we have today. Why? Because we were dominant. And frankly, we didn't want that technology going anywhere. So the system does that perfectly. But in a time of when technology is no longer dominant, we're no longer dominant, that's a problem. So when did we start losing our dominance? Starting in the 90s with commercial. Starting in 2000 when all that commercial technology globalized. And sitting at about 2015, we started realizing that we were losing uh, some of our advantage through asymmetric uh, uh, operations by our adversaries. So the, the basic tenet of what we have here is what once was a great system has to change. If you're no longer technologically dominant, that means there are, there are certain companies and certain countries and certain technologies that we want. And if at some point these firms or these countries no longer want to give that to us. We have to invent it ourselves. And what does that do? It's called technological reinvention. If Google has something that we won't give to us, we in the Department of Defense will have to reinvent it. That takes R&D money. That takes resources. That takes money that you don't have to move in to reinvent something that you could buy. And by doing that, you're taking money away from things that are defense unique like hypersonics, directed energy weapons, things that we should be investing in. Culture is an interesting problem we have. Because when you talk to a number of people, we won the Cold War. We won the Cold War with these systems. We won the Cold War with these processes. But did we really? And I think something to look at, what's, what, what, as we look into 
how we actually won the Cold War. We won with our allies. We won with technologies that were transferred from our allies, starting in World War II. We won with uh, uh, scientists and engineers who came and immigrated to the United States that created the first and second offset systems with, in partnership with us. And we did it in, without, actually we went around the processes we created in the Cold War because we hadn't created them yet in the first offset, we went around them in the second offset. And then the underlying economy is what kicked us into, and the, and the inability of the Soviet Union to keep up is one of the reasons why uh, we, we eventually succeeded. We should basically forget everything we've learned there and move on to this new environment. Where's the new environment? Where's, where's research and development? Where's technology? And so on. And it's globalized. It's commercial, it's globalized. So I'm running out of, I'm about, okay. So as I, as I go through this, this system, I'm, I'm gonna ask you for two questions to ponder because I think these two questions are important to the future. And they are, what incentivizes comp company behavior and what is left to steal? So the first thing is, what are companies thinking about today who have technology that we need? And if I were these companies, and, they've, and, and actually have discussion with these companies, they have all are designing strategies on how to keep, the, to maximize their profits, maximize their reven revenues, and make sure they don't get tripped up by regulatory regimes. So what does that mean? Well, if you're a US company, you don't sell to the US government if you're commercial. You go to the commercial marketplace first so you don't get tripped up by the export controls. You potentially offshore your R&D to keep your intellectual property away from regulators. If you're foreign, you maintain your best technology at home. You sell a secondary version of the United States. That's both US and foreign. You keep US personnel segregated. You make sure no one talks to each other. Why? Because you don't want to get, get an ITAR violation. So here we have four countries who have engineers in the same company, but we can't, we can't talk to each other, which is, is great. And, if you're a f but, and it's not just foreign companies that are doing, thinking about ITAR free, it's US companies as well, and, and based on their subsidiaries and so on. The US government will probably not see that impact because companies are not gonna basically say, I'm not selling you your technology. Companies are just not gonna sell you technology. They're not gonna bring it forward. They're not, you're not gonna know what's out there. And that is a danger to the US. The next issue we have to say, think, talk about is, has a lot of what is, that we've been trying to protect already gone? And are we spending more time regulating technologies among our allies when our adversaries have already taken it. A very interesting article came out about a week ago in Breaking Defense. Uh, Nick uh, Eftimiatis, I'm, I'm probably not, not pronouncing his name right, talks about 400 cases of Chinese espionage here in the United States that are public. If there were 10 cases of Chinese espionage that came out in Canada, and there are only a couple of them that came out when we took away their ITAR uh, waiver back in the 90s, we would be going crazy. The United States has left itself open to getting its pockets picked, and that's problematic. At once, there was the uh, idea of bringing technology out. In the world of cyber theft, you don't have to. I was recently, actually every time I go and talk to a small innovative company, I always ask this question. Have the Chinese been in to talk to you? And normally to a, to a company, they say, yeah, yeah, they, either somebody represented the Chinese or something, you know, to try to, you know, uh, this is, you know, th this is uh, potentially doing direct foreign investment. Obviously, CFIUS is a problem now, but they don't need CFIUS anymore because all they have to do is find out what's, what, this, what these companies are doing 
and then can target them for later. Then I asked the question, has the US government been in there talking about your really cool technology, which could apply to, uh, uh, to defense purposes? And nine times out of 10, the answer is no. The Chinese are all over our, our companies, but we are still looking for them, despite having DIU and a few other areas. All right, so what needs to be done? To compete against this threat, to, to, to maintain our technological dominance, uh, we need to get our science and technolo te technologists working together, not just in the United States, not just with Silicon Valley or Austin or wherever, but with our closest allies. And we need to remove the barriers to doing that. We need to bring the best technologies to the United States, and we need to know what those best technologies are. The way to probably do this is establish an innovation trade, free trade space between us and our closest allies. Why? Because if you have to take a mother may I to get two engineers to talk together that takes six months to get, you know, what's the point? You need to have those, them talking now and working on problems. And uh, now, we need a secure supply chain too. So what's, how, do you, how do you balance that? Well, you balance that with a trusted community. You have a trusted community of firms, of countries, <coughs> of firms, people, probably with security clearances, but at least some type of, of vetting process in a commercial firm that doesn't have security clearances that can work within this trusted community. This probably needs to be taken at a broader level, but I don't see the culture moving beyond in a wholesale fashion until there's agreement on the threat and agreement on how far we actually technologically are behind. So if a complete upheaval of the system is too big of a culture change, NTIB is the perfect test bed to start testing some of these concepts, to provide an alternative system that eventually we can migrate to as we get the bugs out of the system as we feel they're secure, that we have a secure supply chain, that we have trusted community, and that we're achieving the innovation that, that uh, is necessary. We can then, once we've succeeded there, expand that to not only the commercial marketplace, in Silicon Valley, Austin, wherever, but also to our closest, al our closest next tier of allies. And as we try to figure out how to, to bring in more commercial companies and more commercial innovation, we can let, take the lessons learned from that to apply to our allies, because really, they both face the same barriers to innovation, uh, cooperation with the, with the US government. So the report outlines this compelling case why we need to do things. It outlines a number of recommendations, 22 uh, legislative recommendations, hopefully, you don't need to pass 22 legislative recommendations, so the Congress does need. A lot of this could be done by the administration on its own. Uh, I've, I've put the recommendations in four buckets. First bucket is really about governance, about a, um, a, 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 an itinerary of type of, uh, of, of, of issues that should be addressed in a, sen a very senior body with a number of working groups whether it's foreign investment, whether it's secure supply chain, whether it's export control. But the biggest and important, most important recommendation here is recommendation two. Because if we don't change our export control process, we don't change our technology transfer process, we are going to go for it alone. Well, US industry, probably just US defense industry, will be leading the charge. And that may work in the Cold War. It's not gonna work in a world where 95% of R&D is out in the commercial marketplace and globalized. Um, it can work for some things, but probably not everything. Recommendation three talks about acquisition barriers. And uh, they're formidable, but not as formidable as a tech transfer barrier. And finally, the recommendation number four addresses 
how to use the NTIB, how to work our way through this process, and creating the NTIB, uh, using the NTIB as a test bed for future cooperation with not only our other allies, but with Silicon Valley. And so with that, I think I'd like to um, set, the, that's the set the stage, and then we'll go to the next, next yeah. level and have the panel. Excellent. Thank you, Bill. Yep. Uh, the panel up to the stage as they're taking their seats uh, with a little bit of haste I will introduce them uh, they are going to speak in turn uh, offering a few minutes of their own uh, prepared thoughts about the report and about the topic um, and then Bill's going to moderate a conversation among them um, uh, from Bill's left uh, nope from my right is Scott Baum who currently serves as the principal director for industrial policy in the uh, office of uh, industrial policy at DOD he previously served as the director of the Office of Commercial and Economic Analysis for the U U.S. Air Force. He also has been a program manager responsible for applied research projects and legislative liaison support to, to the Undersecretary of Defense Intelligence. He's also been an Army officer. After Scott, uh, Samantha Clark uh, will speak. Samantha is special counsel at the law firm Covington, where she is in its public policy practice group, as well as the CFIUS and government contracts group. Before joining the firm, uh, she served in a number of senior staff positions at the U.S. Senate Armed Services Committee, uh, most recently as Deputy Staff Director and General Counsel. Uh, finally, to her right, and, and speaking after uh, the two of them have, is Brett Lambert. Uh, Brett has been on this stage before. He's the Vice President of Corporate Strategy at Northrop Grumman. Uh, prior to joining that firm, uh, he was an executive in residence with Renaissance Strategic Advisors, a senior fellow at the Nash and a senior fellow at the National Defense Industrial Association. From 2009 to 2013, I have alluded already to the fact that Brett served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Manufacturing and Industrial-Based Policy, that administration's incarnation of the job that Bill had had uh, during the Bush administration. So starting with Scott, turning to Samantha, and then Brett, let's continue the conversation until we're ready to take questions from the audience. Scott. Awesome. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I think, is my mic on? Are we working? Yep. All right. Awesome. So I appreciate it. First, Steve, thank you for inviting me. And Bill, thank you for giving the opportunity to talk about what, from my office, is quite frankly one of the most important structures we manage today in dealing with our closest partners and allies. And I also want to thank the Atlanta Council for their thought leadership. Um, as you mentioned, uh, over the series, speaker series that you have, you're bringing forward some of the most important questions that we have today about how do we ensure we deliver capability to the warfighter. And fundamentally, uh, from my boss, Ellen Lord, and the Office uh, of the Secretary of Defense and Acquisition and, and Sustainment, that is what we do. We deliver cutting edge capability to the warfighter. So thank you for giving us the opportunity to A, be here, but more provide that thought leadership. The more discussion we have on these complex issues, the better off we are collectively. Uh, and so that is why it's important for my office to be here and participate. Before going on and talking about the NTIV, I want to maybe just quickly educate everybody from the Office of Industrial Policy, what are roles and our responsibilities? To just give you a, a, an understanding of the diverse issues that, that come across the office. First, from a policy and outreach perspective, we're responsible for setting the policy structure that deals with industrial policy. And so recently in Washington, uh, we delivered the 13806 report, which was a long-term temporal view of the risk, the strategic risks uh, that the, currently the defense industrial base uh, is dealing with. And what that has allowed us to do is set a template and level set the discussion, not just with our industry, both domestic and international, but our closest allies and partners. Uh, and so within the policy and outreach uh, area, we're also the lead for engagement with industry. That is industry associations, domestic, industry associations, international, and also individual companies. Um, <clears throat> we manage a series of investment vehicles in which the Department of Defense can use to address critical issues inside the industrial base. So often people refer to these as Defense Production Act or Title III, uh, IBAS, and this is where the department can assist addressing what we would say are structural uh, weakness or flaws inside specific industries. We are the lead for the department on CFIUS. And so <clears throat> that places uh, our office uh, closely with our allies and partners, and specifically the NTIB allies and partners, to talk about foreign investment and foreign direct investment and understanding how that has evolved and changed. We're also the lead for reviewing for the department mergers and acquisitions under a series of 
um, antitrust laws that have existed in the United States, but our office uh, in partnership with the FTC executes those reviews to understand what would be the impact to the defense industrial base. And finally, uh, we are responsible for assessments, and that's looking at the health and welfare of industries and sectors that the Defense Department uh, relies upon. And from that generates a series of reports. Often the reports have to go to Congress or our services or our counterparts, uh, including our NTIB counterparts. Our office has long participated in NTIB and previous constructs of NTIB, uh, in Natibo and, and a variety of other structures that are out there. But in 2017, Bill, as you pointed out, um, Congress uh, rounded out the equation with including th the closest partners and allies that we have worked uh, with since World War II and, and quite frankly even before that. Um, and what that has allowed us to do is put a structure in place in which governments can sit down and talk about the evolving nature and challenges of our collective industrial base. Uh, and in the last year, and so I'm recently a member of the industrial policy team, uh, but in my short time being there, I have met with my uh, NTIB counterparts. So I've been in the office less than 30 days, and I can tell you that I've met with my NTIB counterparts um, in Australia face-to-face -face once, and we have probably been on at least uh, three to four conference calls just within 30 days to demonstrate the cadence and the tempo of the discussion that is occurring across the partnership, and I think that's critical. We see NTIB as supporting the three elements of the National Defense Strategy uh, for the Department of Defense, those are the, the core foundational um, elements that we focus on, first being lethality, and as we in, engage our NTIB partners, um, the greatest contribution and the role, uh, the, the strength of the United States is with our partnerships and alliances, and it starts with our closest partners and alliances. Um, we depend on our partners, uh, we depend on our allies and partners for every operation. And so INTIB provides that structure in which we can ensure also the industrial bases uh, deliver that lethality. Uh, the second NDS element is strength in partnerships and alliances. And quite frankly, uh, for INTIB, that has been integral. And INTIB has helped us harmonize our foreign direct investment um, regulations and review processes. And what's important here is that governments will not always agree, and that is okay. But what is important is that we have a structure in which we can have a conversation and sit down and discuss what do we view the collective risk and the collective opportunity. And so NTIB has provided us that structure uh, to do that. And then finally, reform the department. Uh, if you hear Undersecretary Lord talk about this, um, she has launched a whole slew of <clears throat> processes to look at what are we doing in the department, how can we be a better buyer, and this includes buying uh, critical technology and equipment from our partners and allies. Uh, and so uh, mid-May uh, she will be part of the ADAC, right, where we will go sit down and have a ministerial level meeting with our Australian counterparts. Uh, we do the same thing with Canada and uh, the UK as well. So. As we look at NTIB and how can NTIB both support the United States and our partners and allies, I'd like to go through Bill's recommendations and just kind of give a perspective, or at least from the Department of Defense, where, how do we see this and how do we look at that? And hopefully this seeds conversation uh, for the Q&A. One, establishing a, government, a governing body for NTIB. Um, what is most interesting on NTIB is that it's a, uh, within the U.S. Congress, it's U.S. law. And so as we sit down with our counterparts, um, one of the conversations we've recently had is, what's the corollary from our counterparts, right? How do we ensure that uh, both, uh, all of the partners, either through MOA or MOU, what would that structure look like? What would it need to say? It's not to over uh, legislate the issue, it's not to, to put too much paper, but it's also to, to make sure that we all, from the government perspective, uh, are contributing. The second recommendation, harmonizing technology transfer laws, and earlier we talked about that. Today's technology, the dual use technology that all of us depend upon, is complex and the speed at which technology innovation is occurring is rapid. 
And INTIB provides that structure for us to sit down and talk about things that haven't even been considered yet or are still on the science, science table. Um, but when we talk about harmonizing these laws, we have to do that, and especially uh, for Canada, the UK, and Australia. Uh, the innovation occurring in each of our partner nations is critical to us delivering those capabilities and our collective security, right? So everything I'm saying today uh, is based on our collective security as partners. Um, the third recommendation limits socioeconomic and acquisition process. The Department of Defense has long worked to make sure that we have inclusion of our defense partners inside our industrial base, that they can compete, um, uh, they can compete for contracts, they can be part of it. Uh, and we will continue to do that. From the department's perspective, we look to our uh, partners and allies as well for the recipro reciprocity. And I want to thank uh, my partners and allies in the room for working very hard to ensure that continues. Um, all of us face a series of challenges, both domestically and internationally, uh, and we recognize that uh, from the Department of Defense and specifically from uh, the Office of Industrial Policy. And finally, uh, the INTIB should serve as a test bed for innovation. And what I will tell you, Bill, and during the question and answer, I'll bring up maybe specific examples, uh, but today our partners and allies are doing exactly that. Uh, but what I want to highlight is it's occurring in the small startups that are in the UK. It's occurring in the, in, the, in the industries in Australia and in Canada. And whether you see that in mining advancements, whether you see it in natural resources, whether you see it in, in software development, we are looking at um, collectively working together to solve some of our most difficult problems. In conclusion, I want to highlight we don't have all the policy options. These are complex issues and so one of the calls I have today is for industry and for the think tank community and for government to help put more creative solutions on the table and to Bill, I, I thank you for doing the heavy lift and Samantha, you know, I am the recipient of the work you put together um, and it's my job to make sure that we deliver results. And as our last uh, INTIB discussion, the general agreement was let's focus on results. Let's focus on specific things um, that we can collectively do and we're doing that. So thank you for the hard work in doing it. The more policy and creative policy approaches we can have, the better off we are collectively um, and we need help in these answers. And so with that, thank you for the time. And Thanks, Scott. I'll uh, we'll turn next to you, Samantha, please. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Bill, for writing this report and the Atlantic Council for having me today. Working through these issues on the Hill was a very interesting project because I think when Bill and I said about looking at a lot of the history here, you got a range of answers of what's NTIB or um, wait, we're not already doing that. Um, and so it was sort of our job to go back and you know, dissect everything that had occurred from all the way back and explain to people where we are, where we want to be, and particularly I found in the last couple of years with the threat from China that Bill talked a lot about today, what he calls the four times threat. You know, as members were starting to see that, as Secretary Mattis was coming to the Hill and talking about the growing threat with China and Russia, people were thinking, well, gosh, you know, if we have supply chain security issues and we can't necessarily trust the networks we've been using, why wouldn't we work with our allies more? And I think McCain really saw that and really grasped onto that, and he wanted to use the allies as peers, as partners in solving all of these problems. And that's why particularly the legislation, including Australia and the UK, was put into the defense bill. You know, in, as part of this, Bill and I took some field trips. So um, the first one we took was to the UK, and we spent a lot of time there learning about the challenges. We met with the MOD, we met with Rolls-Royce, put on a, a great show for us with all kinds of industry representatives to come and specifically talk about what are your ITAR issues, where can we help. Um, and then Bill and I both separately did the same thing in Canada, and then last year over the 4th of July, I spent my 4th of July in Australia, uh, coincidentally in their defense building, which is called the Russell Building, which is what our Senate office building was called, um, and walked through all of these challenges there, talked about 
their developments and what they're working on in technology and how the U.S. can actually leverage that. And you find through having these conversations so many similarities. So for instance, you know, the Australians are working on a big shipbuilding project and we could share some issues that we saw when we did that or actually be interested in how are you going about recruiting the workforce you need for this and we should learn some of those lessons. And it's, it's not just on the pure import, export, ITAR challenge side, but there are so many other lessons you can learn when you work together on this. Um, and I think, it, I'm not gonna go through all the recommendations, but the one I found the most interesting is where Bill talks about there's really a need to do a harmonization of US code here. There are a lot of instances where instead of a reference to NTIB, it actually just says US Canada. And I'd been thinking a lot about this with the Defense Production Act, um, the 1950 Defense Production Act, which many in this room and Scott probably know as DPA Title III, we like to call it, where we're actually looking to grow a shortage we have in the domestic supply chain. And I went and double checked some legislative history, um, as, as one does, and uh, found something pretty interesting that I wanted to share with you all today. So when DPA Title III went into law, it had been modified multiple times because there's a reauthorization period. And in the 92 reauthorization, language was added in that year that specifically added Canada to say that this was for performing in the US or Canada substantially all of the research and development, engineering, manufacturing, and production activities, specifically focusing on critical components, critical technologies. And what was interesting is the NDAA that passed that year, as you know, Bill kind of gave a little spoiler alert in his speech, also established the NTIP that year. And the language establishing the NTIP, the definition there is, is eerily similar to the definition that was included in the DPA reauthorization. You know, it says this is for research, development, production, maintenance activities conducted within the US or Canada, and then goes on to talk about critical technology. So those the language mirrors each other very well. And so I went back and I thought, well, when did these pass? You know, when was this action on the Senate floor? When was the department looking at it? And it so turns out that the addition for uh, the NTIB that was added in the FY 93 NDAA, the House voted to agree on the conference report on October 3rd, the Senate agreed on October 5th, and then it was signed on October 23rd. Well, fast forward a couple days to the DPA Title III reauth, and you see that the House agreed on October 5th, which was the day the Senate was agreeing to the NTIP language, and then the Senate agreed on October 8th, and that was signed on October 28th. So you can see there that that was actually a tandem effort that was being worked on at the same time. It was intended to be a similar effort, but because when you write legislation like this, um, and Bill and I had a lot of experience here, you specifically are putting in what's going to be actionable immediately. So I'm sure Scott could speak to the sort of regulatory rulemaking delays that sometimes occur. Yeah. Um, and so you put in, okay, US, Canada, go start, implement, well, we're gonna take some time to create what the NTIB actually is and implement that later. And so Bill's recommendation about let's go back and let's harmonize and let's say anywhere there's a reference to US, Canada, that probably should say NTIB and that probably should include our UK and Australian partners. And to do that look and to find if it's not in every instance, you know, where might it not be, but I would, guess in 99% of the cases that is the intent and I think that's an effort that uh, would be very interesting for the armed services committees to undertake. I know Bill and I would have a heck of a lot of fun with it so um, I think those are the types of things that are almost easy wins or easy cleanups to get this moving along where you're taking a concept that's evolved over time but then you need to go back and make sure that the code actually reflects that and that's why Bill's legislative recommendations are so important because it shows how you can do that, it shows different approaches to doing that, and it really gets the conversation going in a meaningful way. You know, as a, a former staffer, you know, this is very actionable. Um, and so, you know, the seriousness of it and all the support that I know Bill went and did those trips again, and the support you all gave him in that is, is so instrumental to getting this done. So. I'm just thrilled that we're having this conversation. Bill, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this and I'll kick it over. Thanks. Thank you and thanks, um, Bill, for the report. It really is good. Whenever I read uh, something like this, I try to look at it through a, a lens of, you know, is it, is it interesting? And this is certainly interesting. 
Uh, is it actionable? Very impressive. I agree with you. There's a lot of implementation uh, opportunities. Uh, but then th those actions, will they have any result? And, and that's where I, I worry. Um, regardless of what uh, the Hill language the Hill might pass or what any one administration might do to tinker around the edges, I think we all have to recognize that this problem has developed over decades. And, and, and Bill does a nice job, I think, of, of highlighting some of the elements of the problem. And, uh, but I think we need to be honest with ourselves of how we got here. And it, some of it was paranoia. Uh, a lot of it was, frankly, American hubris. Uh, anyone who's traveled significantly recently internationally to our allies realize that they're on a technology part in many cases ahead of us and we find it hard to come to grips with that and I think that's more of a cultural uh, than it is a, a factual uh, instinct and if you just think about uh, at Bill wrote in the front part of the of the report which I liked is kind of the the tier of trails of, of American um, a decline in the technological sphere. You know, we, we got, we talked about the arsenal of democracy and it's in the report, but really was an arsenal of technology uh, that was built up through that second generation. And then we did everything we could to husband that second offset technology to, to wrap ourselves around it. And over time, we've tinkered with it legislatively. Uh, we've tinkered with ITAR. We put in language, some of which could be used more efficiently than it is now. Uh, and we've tried to applique over the problem, but we haven't gotten to the fundamental problem. We've, we've talked about building higher walls around fewer things, probably not enough concentration on the fact that the really important part of that equation is to continue innovation so that you're creating things that people want to steal. Uh, once they stop wanting to steal it, the walls don't really matter. And if you uh, look at the degradation of the Defense Department, in particular, is a, is a, a ratio in ratio to commercial spending, particularly on the technologies of most import right now in our collective, the NITB collective national defense, it's becoming uh, more and more uh, minuscule, and we're not tapping into those broad markets. And frankly, even if we had the implementing language to tap into them, in my conversations with a lot of my industry partners, a lot of them don't want to work with us uh, because we make it too hard. Uh, and so that's not just here in the U.S. It's, it's I'm sure it's, uh, it's true among our closest allies too. So I think we, we need to take, we need to be a, have an honest assessment of, of any changes that we will implement. Uh, what effect will those changes have and what are the role that both industry and governments have to execute or to, to rationalize the expectations into, into actionable and prag uh, pragmatic steps that can really change behavior and change culture because at the end of the day, we've tinkered many times with ITAR. We have a lot of implementing legislation that could allow us to do it. We have two treaties and none of them had succeeded. And at some point you have to step back and say all of this effort is going in both legislatively and in the administration to change these rules, but we're still not getting traction. We're still not seeing great benefits. It's still, be, it's still just too hard. So I don't think that the, um, uh, that anything that I read in the recommendations is, is is out of line or wouldn't be accepted. I think it's all rational. Again, my concern would be how do we effectively implement it? And that leads to the last point I'd make just before leaving, having been in uh, both industry and then government and then back in industry. Industry has a significant role to play here, uh, much greater than an individual program or an individual effort that uh, an industry or a particular company might be, uh, might be trying to, to take on. We tend to, as industry, look at things in these very stovepipe uh, manners when it comes to both exports and re-exports, just as our clients do. The industry mimics its client very well, and that's probably a, a fault of both of us. Uh, these more innovative approaches, more holistic approaches, I think industry and, and the sponsors of this report is a perfect example. Industry has a role to play to help harmonize the desirability that both government and industry partners have, but they can't do it in these one-off exceptional ways. And I think everyone gets really excited when there is a success between technology cooperation particularly between the NTIB um, and U.S. and, and Europe, uh, either Australian or Canadian or, or U.K. companies, but it's a one-off example, and it's usually excruciatingly hard to do it, and it's usually not repeatable. Uh, it tends to be unique, and so I think industry, by highlighting and supporting these kinds of efforts, can play an important role in reinforcing the desire that governments state that they have and turning those into reality. So it's an important first step, but I would say it's a it's a, it's a very long road uh, to make it a reality. And, and it, we have to do these, we have to get this language, but it's just one of many things. And, and the culture 
on both the industrial side and the government side is probably the biggest hurdle we'll face. All right. Well, with, with that, I uh, just got a little, little bit of time uh, in, in uh, questions and answers, and then I think we're going we're gonna to open it to the, uh, to the audience. So please think of some great questions, all right? Uh, Brett, let me start, start with you, uh, if you don't mind. Um, depends on the question. Well, it depends on the question, obviously. <laughs> obviously. If not, you can pass. Yeah. But uh, how, you know, a lot of this has to do with bringing together engineers, uh -huh. scientists, within you know, companies and, and having them talk to you. How much more productive do you think the US industrial base could be, you know, the defense unique industrial base, if it would have the freedom to actually tap into uh, the, the various uh, uh, companies and actually, actually your own subsidiaries or even your own investments that you've made uh, overseas? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a, it would be a factor uh, of difference uh, if it was done uh, in a more comprehensive and in a, a more um, uh, logical, from a business perspective, a logical way. I mean, I think that with all of our uh, individual uh, uh, expenditures of our of our governments, uh, it is increasingly true that they're demanding both ourselves and our our closest allies are demanding more content be derived and be developed uh, locally, which makes perfect sense as they try to mature their industrial base. So. That reality is occurring uh, among all of our allies, and so that means you need to have kind of homerooms. You need to have uh, presence and, and uh, brick and mortar structures and engineering collaboration. And our rules um, for that kind of collaboration are, make it very, very problematic and very difficult. So you're actually not, um, in some ways, you're actually losing efficiencies. If it was a straight FMS cell or something like that, you could have everyone in the same area. But when, when the desire is to exchange information and to create this uh, intib environment, not being able to have those engineers discuss with one another. Uh, I mean, there were some great um, uh, engineering schools, take the example in Australia and the work they've been doing on hypersonics. I mean, there's some great talent that uh, any industry or any company would love to tap into, but the rules currently make that very, very difficult. And that's loss of efficiency. Samantha, you uh, worked uh, when you were on the Hill on supply chain security. And, uh, and everyone else can jump into this as well, but uh, how do you uh, uh, see the NTIB fitting within that whole, because uh, that, I mean, that, that's a really, you know, on one sense we want to want to have, you know, everyone cooperating at the same time, uh, the, the fear is that your, your, uh, our supply chains are going to be uh, vulnerable. Uh, we may not trust uh, supply chains of, you know, of various companies and so on. How, how, how do we square the circle on this, so to speak? Yeah, that's a great question, Bill. And I think that was one of the reasons that our former boss, uh, late Chairman McCain, was so you know, passionate about this issue because he saw the NTIB as a solution to that. So in last year's NDA, the John S. McCain NDA, there was a Section 889 on supply chain security that particularly requires companies to make sure that they don't have particular Chinese technologies in their systems if they want to sell to the government. And the DOD is in the process of looking at that and writing regulations and working with other agencies to do so because it is a government-wide effort. But using the NTIB and particularly the you know, expansion of the NTIB as a solution to that and having all of the countries working together to protect supply chain and looking at them as we have Canada for a long time as an integral part of the U.S. domestic supply chain is a, a good solution to that if you're able to coordinate it, if you're able to implement it, if you can get over the, the cultural barriers that Brett talked about, it's, that is a, a big challenge. But there's already more legislation this year looking at those issues and you know, not just on the supply chain side, but also on the university side and who should be doing research at our universities and who are our trusted partners and who aren't. And I think all of the NTIP countries are looking at that issue similarly and all have found challenges with it. And it just, it, it doesn't make any sense to not work together on this. You, know, you have the golden opportunity to come together and solve this problem. And so implementing a lot of these changes is going to help get us there. And I'm sure, you know, Scott could probably tell you, there's a lot of work behind the scenes where the governments are trying to do this or trying to collaborate and work together. But unless it is formalized in this way, I think it's hard to make sure that that's something that's everlasting and that actually has outputs that all nations are agreeing to towards the same goal. Um, Scott, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of discussions on 5G and a few other things, but, but
but what, what, what would you say so far is the, uh, the, the greatest progress we've seen in the NTIB cooperation? Is it foreign direct investment or is it? Uh, yeah, so um, I'll, I'll kind of do a, a top level, my, uh, my belief, right, my observations, and then work through some details. Uh, it is very important, and all of you know this sitting up here, uh, it is so important to have structures in which governments are able to sit down and talk, right? Um, and I know uh, if you haven't been part of the, the process, you're thinking, what do you mean? You should just be able to get, you know, get on a plane, go up there, schedule a meeting, and just make it happen. And I think all of us, whether any form of government, you know, whether you're on the executive branch, um, the uh, legislative branch, et cetera, it is not easy, right? So for the NTIB giving a formalized structure that allows us to engage with each other, pick up the phone, ask questions is critical. So to that end, the, the outcomes. Uh, harmonization of, in uh, the continued harmonization, this isn't a one and done event, but foreign direct investment, uh, the, the ability to sit down, call meetings, call experts together, host meetings um, is critical to that, right? So FDI has been a, a, a large kind of a place that we've made substantial progress. Also um, in the deep heavy lift of government, I'd like, you know, highlight section uh, 842 of the uh, last year's NDAA, uh, substantial progress has been made. Uh, matter of fact, uh, just within the last few weeks we, within the department, we've been able to move, uh, take major steps in national interest determinations. So, it, you know, I, I understand it's deeply technical and we're throwing these uh, parts of the NDA around as if everybody knows them, but um, that is a uphill lift um, and now we're seeing the benefit of that, right? So, um, in, in, in one sense, a, a lot of what the NTIB is about, essentially, we're, you know, we're, we're looking at a, uh, you know, a five eyes of industrial base, really moving down, and, a, and it basically leading to a differentiation uh, of application of various uh, rules, whether it's the ITAR or other. Um, how, I mean, uh, what are the barriers to that? I mean, so essentially, you know, we, we've, we've spent uh, a lot of time trying to not differentiate between foreign countries. Yeah. And, and, and so this is, this is the beginning of a, a tiering, which has always been a, been a problematic, at least in the foreign policy world. Is that, is that something we, we should be concerned about or is it something we should embrace? I mean, I, 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 I won't tell you my opinion on that, but, but uh, is, is, is that gonna lead to major problems, I think? And anyone who wants to jump in, please. Yeah, I think that is a challenge and I think you know, when the Burma legislation was done that was modifying the CFIUS process for foreign transactions with the United States. Um, they struggled with that concept of do you have a white list or a black list? Do you name people or do you kind of do it internally but not make it formal? And what's the risk reward there and what do you get out of that? You know, in the end, they decided not to formalize it. And I think that does become a challenge. And I think it's a challenge on the Hill. You know, they do have to deal with sanctions. The Foreign Relations Committee spends a lot of time dealing with sanctions, dealing with foreign military sales. And if you can't sell somewhere, what are your other solutions? And what's that threshold? You know, the Senate spent a ton of time last year dealing with the Turkey situation. Um, I'm sure a lot of you saw a lot of news about that. Um, and so until there's a level of comfort in that, I think it's, that's a big challenge. And I think that also, not just the NTIB, but all allies and partners being able to come together and have a trusted network sort of in some ways eliminates the need to do that because if you have a trusted supply and it's easy, you don't have to make some of those other decisions. Yeah, you talk about, you know, it's, it's an interesting uh, cultural perspective of we always feel awkward of, of naming and not. Um, I think multiple um, leaders in the Department of Defense have stated, you know, the fundamental fact that we cannot envision a military operation in which to our right and our left we don't have our closest partners and allies. Period. Right? And so sometimes we don't even want to differentiate between our potential adversaries, you know, but so you know, so, so well, not just be differentiating yeah. between our allies, but also so, so but for this conversation on Intib, so you know, and that and history has shown that I need to look backward a hundred years and I and my fully plan on looking forward uh, a thousand years. And so the point is is uh, we acknowledge that. Um, and so We've acknowledged that in the intelligence community. Uh, we are acknowledging that in the industrial base. We acknowledge that in different partnerships with the air, with the different services. We have a land component of this. We have an air component, a naval component, right? Um, and so what you what you bring forward is is the fundamental fact. Collectively, uh, democratic societies based on rule of law, right? 
our partners, and so what are the structures we need to have in place to make sure that that's an endearing event? Uh, you want to wrap, or shall we turn to? No, go ahead. All right. Let's uh, pick some questions from what I happen to know is a fairly expert audience. In fact, I would several times uh, uh, have interrupted for explanation of acronyms and other things. But I know that this is a pretty expert audience, and so we can start on step two uh, with this group. Um, could I see a show of hands of those of you who do have questions, so I can get a sense for how we're going to spend 15 minutes? There's one, two, three hands, four. All right. Well, that is few enough that I'm going to get the first question in, and then we'll turn to those. If there had been 15 hands, I would not have exercised this prerogative. Um, the politics of this is what I want to know. In, in a certain respect, um, probably not in this audience, uh, most of whom are kind of invested in the success of this, mm -hmm. but in the greater context in which we're dealing, this um, sounds like it's running straight against the grain of some parts of the administration, some parts of Capitol Hill, maybe some parts of our own al allies' po politics. Um, let's keep it here at home. Um, just give me a sense of the politics of Bill's recommendations um, in this season. And uh, we'll start with Brett, because he uh, didn't get to answer the last question. And then I'll pick up starting with this gentleman right here. Can uh, I answer the last question? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you passed on that, buddy. I you know, the, the politics are always going to be an issue. So that's why it's important in any of these discussions, I think, to focus on outcomes. What, what outcome are you trying to achieve? Um, and you're going to have to deal with the political environment. I think one of the issues I see with, with this, um, with the cooperation overall with our allies is that, you know, you, you have to have the right policies, you have to have the right statements, you know, and you're, you have the legislation like this language where you're trying to lead this horse, you know, to water, but then you look behind yourself and you realize it's, you're leading a camel and it's not going to drink for a while. So you just have to keep going and keep trying and trying and eventually the outcomes do result. We've already seen some good progress with our uh, allies in some areas of cooperation. And I think if we just stick to it, it will outlast the politics, whether it's you know, for it or rapidly, rapidly against greater cooperation. Uh, I think it's the, the, the reasonable policies that we can implement and with rational people on both sides uh, of, of the oceans, uh, I think they'll prevail in the end because we, there isn't an alternative. Now, we are losing a technological edge here and this is, a, this is a, a solid option to recapture some of that capability and we're just squandering it by squabbling. Samantha, what are the prospects, let's just this summer, for these kind of legislative proposals? Sorry. Well, no, I'll spare you the long lecture on where the process is and how that works sort of on the procedure side, but I would say if they were presented with these recommendations and had time to consider them for, for the cycle, I think some of them, like the harmonization and, and those types of recommendations, could easily be inserted, and I think a lot of people would think of those as code cleanup or just smart continuations of policy that's been in place for a long time. I think there, you, you get more challenging the more detailed you get. And I think he, Bill's been working on these issues for a long time and he certainly knows where a lot of those touch points are. Um, and I think you know expanding beyond the core NTIB we have now and bringing in other allies, which is where we'd eventually want to get, I don't think we're there yet. I think they would look at how do we further the NTIB we already put in place. The ITAR issue is the hardest because it involves multiple committees of jurisdiction. You have to get the Foreign Relations Committee involved, the Armed Services Committee is going to be involved, the Banking Committee is going to be curious about it, Commerce probably wants a say, and by the time you coordinate that you're looking at another year into the future. But I do think there are some pieces in here that that could go in, and I think the administration's already kind of testing this concept and what it's doing on 5G and the Huawei debate and what the other countries, and primarily they're talking about n countries when they talk about that issue, what direction they're going, where can everybody work together on it, and does it make sense to use that as a way to instruct supply chain security, or does it not? Scott, I wouldn't put a career member of senior executive <laughs> service on the spot here exactly to talk about the politics of yeah. this, but, but how is this going to be received in the Pentagon generally? Yeah, how it's going to be received in the Pentagon. Okay, so first, um, we appreciate all 22 legislative recommendations. We may not agree with all of Bill's recommendations, 
Uh, but you know, what's important is they're having a conversation is point one. Point two is the mill-to-mill -mill relationship with our closest partners and allies is foundational. Um, and we often find in the Department of Defense that that relationship uh, helps communicate when there are other friction points going on between our, bet and, and nations will always do that. But the mill to mill relationship we have found is, is a foundational. Uh, and the best time to plant a tree was 40 years ago. The next best time is today. So the hard issues with ITAR, the hard issues, um, it's, we got to get going plant the tree. Okay, we're going to take a question from that gentleman there, and then there was a woman right there who will take the next question from. Please, go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you. Peter Lichtenbaum with Covington and Berlin, a colleague of Samantha's mm. and a, uh, a friend of Bill's. Um, uh, so, first off, I, I, I served at Commerce Department as uh, uh, an export control official under the uh, Bush administration. Um, and also at BAE Systems in the in the defense industry, um, and I'm broadly sympathetic with Bill with your recommendations, as you know. Um, and I think uh, to the question that was just discussed, that actually there are some reasons to think that the politics could be supportive, because probably the biggest issue that we've seen over the last couple years, legislatively in the executive branch and going forward, is China. And I think that. What you're talking about here is really important when it comes to, as you said, Bill, doing our best to pull together in order to um, marshal our resources um, to contain and, as necessary, confront China. And I think some of the uh, political dynamics on the Hill are different than the last time around in 2003, 2004, I believe it was. Um, when the uh, country exemption was considered, uh, sent up by Secretary Powell and uh, uh, Chairman Hunter and Chairman Hyde were there. Um, those types of perspectives on the Hill are probably uh, not as prevalent anymore, and instead we have China hawks uh, who might be sympathetic to uh, the importance of working together with our allies. I do have a question, um, <laughs> in case you're wondering. Thank you, Peter. Um, uh, but, but first, just to say one thing, you're, you're very quick. Um, the State Department's DTAG uh, made similar recommendations. That's on the website of the DTAG. I've worked on those five eyes. What's so, the DTAG? I will ask I'm sorry, acronym. Defense Trade Advisory Group. It's the advisory group to the State Department. So those are broadly supportive of bills. Um, the question is, you have a recommendation in there about um, uh, that goes beyond the NTIB to uh, deference by the U.S. to uh, allow the NTIB partners leeway to export beyond NTIB to other countries. And, you know, I certainly understand the logic of it, but I do wonder um, whether uh, the foundation for that has been laid, whether there is sufficient uh, comfort with the uh, export control policies of the other countries to say we are going to allow them to decide for everything that we export to the UK, to the Australia, to Australia and to Canada uh, complete leeway as far as uh, where to go and whether, it would, whether there's an intermediate step there in terms of ensuring uh, basic alignment of export control policies. Thank you, Peter. Why don't we yeah, uh, fix uh, that uh, right on Bill? Absolutely. Um, I think eventually we have to be, get there. And, and the reason if we don't get there, I think more and more uh, uh, firms within the NTIB uh, will just <coughs> not play. I think we're at that point now where technology has moved to the point in our allies where they have a choice whether to play with us or not. And if we can't within the construct of the, co the, the governments agree on who we should or should not export our technology to uh, at that level and then allow each government to determine, uh, you know, to operate that, uh, uh, that system. Uh, we're, we're still back to the U.S. mother may I uh, situation where uh, uh, this, this, you know, it's not in anybody's interest to cooperate with us. And we want people to cooperate. So the idea of, of if we cooperate and then the UK decides it wants to, wants to sell this new uh, widget 
that has US content, Australian content, Canadian content, and, and UK content. Um, that should be a sovereign decision, but at the same time, it should be discussed in the NTIP. And there also should be certain technologies that each com country is going to say, we still want control over that, oh, you know, certain types of technology. And that's on that, uh, if, you, if you look in the recommendations, and we're getting a little technical, on, you know, whatever we declare is, 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 is and in the, in the recommendations in the top secret level, it could be something other criteria, but it's, there's a certain a, a list that will be ex accepted that each country will consider as their crown jewels. And you know, that's still gonna be control. But everything else, um, the idea is to incentivize cooperation and, 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 and the, the whole fact of if you continue to have that extraterritorial application, uh, I just don't see that cooperation ever happening. The question is there, and then we're gonna come to this distinguished gentleman with the green tie on the other side of the floor. Please. Uh, my name's Alison Petrel, thank you. Uh, recently arrived, so uh, I think I've been in the country for three weeks. I'm at the Australian Embassy and representing uh, the Australian Department of Defence's Capability Acquisition and Sustainment Group. So definitely not an expert and cannot talk eloquently about many of these issues. Um, but uh, so first I wanted to thank the sponsors and the Atlantic Council for allowing us to have this dialogue today. And uh, then I just wanted to, I guess, make an observation, Bill, you talk in the report about culture and, uh, and a culture um, that uh, you don't use the word distrust, but you talk about lack of trust. And, uh, and, and I guess implying a fairly significant cultural change is needed uh, to take us where you think we need to go. And, um, I don't know much about much, but I do know there you could fill uh, this room with books on cultural change and many theories about that. But uh, now we're talking about people and that sort of what's in it for me and will I be able and how do we tap into that. So my question actually, Brett, is for you. If we were to fast forward 18 months, say, and all the recommendations that Bill has made have been given effect, so they're in legislation, what would it take to change the culture to give effect to that legislation? If we just put the legislation in effect, would that be enough to introduce trust or would we need to do something else? And I already want a two finger response to yeah. whatever Brett says, okay. Well, I think it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, it's necessary but not sufficient to your point. I mean, I, um, uh, culture can be changed and it can be changed because the, the individuals desire it changed or it can be changed because somebody above them tells them to change that culture, and particularly in, a, in an organization like the Pentagon or, or even at the State Department, that does carry a lot of weight. You, you, all of the, these efforts over the last few years, in many ways, have been uh, good intention people trying to remove excuses from people who, don't, who just want to say no for a living. You know, it's a lot easier to say no than yes. So every time they say no, well, we can't do something because of X, Y, or Z. Well, okay, let's fix X, Y, or Z. And so we spend two years fixing X, Y, or Z, and we go back and I say, oh, did I say X, Y, and Z? I meant R and S were the problem. And so we go back and fix that. So there's a lot of that back and forth. Slowly, we're knocking off the alphabet. Uh, and eventually, hopefully, these, uh, these pockets of resistance will be more and more isolated. So in 18 months, do I think there'll be a significant change? No, but do I hope that an activity like this can help open a bit of the floodgates so industry can feel more confidence and can, and can apply more pressure with that confidence that the right thing needs to happen and now we're enabled to do it. I'm more optimistic to getting to that level than a wholesale change. And, and, I, and, I, and I think culture is not gonna change until there's a compelling case to change. And that's gonna be a complete recognition that the threat has changed. And, and I think there's gonna be a rec have to recognition that the United States is not technologically dominant like, the, like it used to be. And that's going to take some time, because those who are are or one are, night. are oh yeah well <laughs> one night you're right those who are 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 working the system truly believe that they're protecting national security. The mm -hmm. issue you have to change the national security debate. Mm -hmm. Let's do uh, we're, we're very uh, close to five thirty. I'd like to do a lightning round, quick question, quick answer, quick question uh, from this lady, quick answer, and then we'll put a wrap to it. Great. Hey everybody, uh, Jerry McGinn, uh, George Mason University, proud alum of um, <laughs> manufacturing industrial-based policy, industrial policy, whatever you want to call it these days. Um, my question is, 
uh, builds a little bit on what Peter was talking about. So I was also a veteran of the uh, Defense Trade Cooperation Treaties when I was on the industry side in, in uh, your company now, Brett. And the, also, the, they, f they failed in, in ways, because I, I try to get my company interested in other companies engaged on that, and we just really struggled. So one thing that uh, I want to ask you about, about with today's effort with the NTIB is it just really creates a tremendous uh, opportunity for government to incentivize industry. Now, I think that foreign direct investment, that work needs to be government to government. But what can you do? You have identified in the executive order on defense industrial base a lot of weaknesses. And there are a lot of places where, uh, in particularly materials and chemicals, where Australia and Canada have tremendous ability to, where you could really work, create incentives for industry to get engaged to help mutually address it in, um, industrial base weaknesses. So. Got it. You, you know the question. Are we going right. to do something to use our allies to yeah. address some of these vulnerabilities and shortcomings? So I will tell you. Short answer. Yeah, Jerry, in the short time, we're absolutely doing that. Uh, my partners and allies, uh, that is foundational to the conversations we are have had, are having, and plan to have within the next probably 30 days. Quick, quick question, please. And then we're going to take one more from this gentleman on the aisle, and then we'll wrap. Go ahead, please. Uh, one moment, please. Again, please. Uh, uh, Lois Nicholson from the British Embassy. Uh, I'm responsible for defence acquisition technology, and I'm actually the UK deputy on the NTIP. So, uh, <laughs> so from uh, my perspective, uh, a quick wrap-up question for all the panel members: um, What would good look like? What would good look like? I'm going to ask one panelist to answer that because we're in the lightning round. Samantha, what would good look like? I think good would look like allies and partners collaborating together, particularly on the NTIB side, free flow of goods and services, software, um, IP agreements that are easy to track and follow that are going back and forth without, you know, lots of heartburn on We're technical not, data rights. I know, I know. <laughs> wouldn't, that, wouldn't that be lovely? That's kind of the unicorn to crack. But I think having both the flow of goods and services and technical data would be a ideal, but if you can't get there, at least fixing the ITAR problem would really be great. <laughs> Two words, technological dominance, Re restoration, three words, restoration of technological dominance. That's a shorter four. way of four. saying that, yeah. Okay, last question comes from this row here. They, they seem to be deferring to one another, sir. <laughs> Hi, Bill Newsma from IBM. I'm hey, a former colleague of Bill's at at and uh, have been uh, executive in uh, defense industry at startups. Uh, and now on the commercial side. So my question for the panel is signaling commercial industry. Bill, you alluded to the growth of commercial industry as the innovation engine mm -hmm. currently. So mm -hmm. we've heard in the report, you're signaling the national security apparatus on intent and need. Uh, defense industry doesn't need so much signaling because they're, they're, fairly, they're fairly well aligned with the client Talk to, talk to us about how to signal commercial industry. Right, and, and, and in the report, I'm trying to signal the commercial industry that the problem that our allies face is the same that commercial industry faces. And even more so, the problems that the commercial industry faces in Australia, in the UK, in Canada, are the same problems that Silicon Valley faces. And, and the governments of the Australia, of Australia, UK, and Canada could actually potentially do a better job than the US if they figure out how to solve the civil military integration problem of bringing in their commercial tech to their d defense unique and solving problems in a way that creates new technologies that are disruptive. It's very possible that they'll succeed before we succeed and we in the, in, as a part of the NTIB need to take advantage of that as well. So there's a lot of signaling trying to do that to equate Silicon Valley commercial with our allies. Okay, that is going to put a wrap on this. I hope that the event has uh, started the conversation, continued a conversation, but more hopefully still added some urgency to it. This is this, the, the problem set, which Bill takes time in the report to describe and, and that Brett uh, underscored in his prepared remarks, is, is, is pretty urgent, uh, is pretty almost alarming. Um, if, you, if you look at some of the uh, both anecdotes and, and case studies uh, of, of what goes wrong uh, because we don't have a more well-integrated industrial base uh, with, our, with our close allies. 
Um, so I hope this has uh, continued the conversation, added a, a, a jab of urgency to it. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank the three panelists who joined Bill um, to help uh, illuminate these issues. And I really want to thank, again, Bill Greenlaw, the huge effort uh, that he has undertaken here. Um, thank you, Bill, on behalf of the council. Um, let's all uh, go forward and see what we can do with it.